All right, everyone, thank you for waiting. Uh, without further ado, let's start the meeting. So welcome to our November SAW quarterly meeting. My name is Bobby Doe, and I'm the lead data analyst on the SAW core team from the Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative, PHAC, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Center on Aging and Health, along with Dr. Victoria Fan, Amalia Recci, and Lane Nakano. Uh, we hope everyone is enjoying their week and you know ready to rest for the weekend. I'm sure we all need some rest these days. But to start off the meeting, I just wanted to have a quick overview of the agenda, which hopefully you can all see. So first, we're going to be doing welcome and introductions. And then our first presentation will be by uh, David Jackson and Punani He from the State of Hawaii Department of Health Child and Adolescent Mental Health Division, otherwise known as CAMD. And they'll present on CAMD data. And followed by that, we'll have a short 10-minute presentation Q&A. And then we'll have a 10-minute break. And then for the second half of the meeting, we'll have Kyle Shizaka and Jeanette DeMello branch directors from the Kalihi YMCA present on the substance abuse and treatment program for teens. Followed by that, we'll have a 10 minute Q&A for them and then we'll just be closing. And so, stop share. So first, uh, I saw the chat. Is Jeanette in the attendees right now, Kyle? I don't think I see her. Uh, Bobby, yes, I believe she's in the attendees. This is Kyle. Uh, what name is she under? I don't think I see her. Or if she's not here right now, we can add her since she'll be uh, going for the second presentation. And in the meantime, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the Hawaii Strategic Prevention Framework Partnership for Success. So the SCAW is a part of the Hawaii Strategic Prevention Framework Partnerships for Success, otherwise known as SPF-PFS, which is a federal, federal grant funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA. And the purpose of the SPF-PFS is to strengthen and enhance Hawaii's prevention system to promote well-being and reduce the impact of underage drinking among persons aged 9 to 20 in Hawaii's communities. So the SEOW is a partnership between the Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, otherwise known as ADAD, the University of Hawaii Center on Aging, and other interested community stakeholders. The SEOW has been providing epidemiologic services to ADAD since 2006 and collects, analyzes, and reports substance use incidents and prevalence as well as provides technical assistance and training for state and community stakeholders. The SCAW comprises researchers, epidemiologists, data managers, and other professionals involved in research, data collection, and utilization pertaining to underage drinking and substance use. And for the SCAW, the SCAW core team, which is us, produces the Hawaii State Epidemiologic Profile for Alcohol and Drugs using the latest available data from diverse data sources to profile the current substance use situation locally. In addition, we conduct quarterly meetings such as this one, where individuals and organizations have the opportunity to share their substance use related data. And so that's a quick background on the PFS SPF project and the SEOW. So, oh, I see, Kalihi YMCA. Gotcha. I'll make you a panelist right now. And so before we begin, uh, there's just a couple of reminders that we wanted to go over. So in case you didn't no notice, we're using the Zoom webinar format, which might look a little bit different from the regular Zoom meeting format that you might be used to. And so for the Zoom webinar, uh, attendees are muted and videos are off. And so presenters and hosts won't be able to see the attendees and the attendees won't be able to see themselves. And so if you have questions, whether you know, just during the meeting or for the actual uh, speakers, then please send them through the Q&A feature, which you should be uh, seeing as a button located at the bottom min uh, middle of your Zoom window. And so you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. So you know, feel free at any time, if you have a question or a comment, to submit it either through the Q&A if possible, or if not, through the chat. And you know, if you want to wait until the actual Q&A section at the end, that's totally fine too. And so, um, hopefully that all makes sense. You know, if you have any questions, you know, just feel free to put them in the Q and A or in the chat. And so it looks like everyone's here and we're all good. So uh, I thought, you know, let's kick in with the first presentation. So 
Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Jackson and Punani He from Camdi. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be with you today. Um, I'm Punani He. I'm a clinical psychologist with Camdi, and I'm here today with Dr. David Jackson, our research and evaluation specialist. Today, we'll be talking with you about treating substance use in the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Division, which we also, also refer to by its acronym CAMD. Um, I'll be starting today just giving an overview of CAMD services, then we'll get into substance use and CAMD use and substance use treatment for CAMD use. Um, so just to give a, a sense of our services, um, we do serve kiddos uh, between the ages of three to 18, sometimes up to actually the age 21 uh, to support those transition age youth. Um, population wise, our kiddos are about slightly less than half um, uh, of our kiddos are female, um, average age of about 13 and a half years and primarily a multi-ethnic population. In terms of the most uh, frequent uh, diagnoses that we see, in terms of primary diagnosis, we have about a quarter of our kiddos um, meet criteria for some sort of a disruptive impulse control or conduct disorder, um, followed by depressive disorders, ADHD specifically, and adjustment disorders. If we take a look at any diagnosis um, that a kiddo in our population may have, we see about the same thing with um, disruptive behavior disorders being diagnosed most frequently, then followed by ADHD, depressive disorders, and adjustment disorders. Uh, to become eligible for our services, a youth needs to qualify for a mental health diagnosis that was provided by a qualified mental health professional, so, so basically a licensed uh, provider. Um, they cannot be eligible for our services if they only have a standalone substance use disorder or developmental disability. Um, in addition uh, to having that mental health diagnosis, um, they also need to be exhibiting some sort of significant fun functional impairment either at home, at school, or in the community. Uh, our, we do serve a primarily um, Medicaid population, and there are some other um, funding sources for our services, so including youth who uh, um, uh, receive IDEA services at the school, for example, and, and sometimes some other funding streams as well. We have a pretty broad service array. Um, each youth that becomes eligible for CAMD services, um, will be assigned a care coordinator that's located in the regional family guidance center through which their services are coordinated. Um, so for example, I've been the psychologist at the Kauai Family Guidance Center um, for a handful of years. Um, we are FGC um, physically located in Lihui, although many of us, most of us are teleworking nowadays. Um, we do serve kiddos for the entire island in more populous areas, so um, for example, Hawaii Island, and then obviously Oahu, there are multiple office locations through which kiddo services are coordinated. Um, in addition to having a care coordinator that will be providing intensive case management for that youth, they will also have a clinical team that will include either a psychologist or a psychiatrist. CAMD does contract with several different private agencies statewide um, who does the bulk of the direct services for our youth and cases then are co-managed between CAMD and the treating provider. Um, we offer a broad array of services. Um, these are both home and community-based and are really need, uh, meant to meet the specialized needs of our youth. Um, on the lower end of our services, we offer um, several different uh, in-home programs and all the way up to on the higher end of care, our hospital-based residential services. We also promote the use of evidence-based practices and services across the levels of care. So substance use disorders, like I was saying before, on their own, don't qualify for CAMD services, but they can co-occur with another psychiatric disorder. Um, in addition, all of our contracted service providers are expected to have substance use treatment integrated into their care. In particular, we do have um, two evidence-based services within our array of um, home-based home treatment approaches um, that have been effective for treating substance use concerns in adolescents. So these are multi-systemic therapy 
and functional family therapy. And these are services that are available to youth statewide. Um, looking to more of our community-based residential services, we also do have one specialized residential program that's often utilized the most um, for substance use concerns. So this graph is to give you an overall picture of the number of youth we serve. So generally within each year, there are about 2000 plus youth um, that we serve at any point within the year. Um, and a lot of these youth do continue across multiple years. Um, also, since many of us might be interested in the effects of the pandemic, I've included a marker where you can see the slight change in trajectory over after the pandemic. Um, so since the peak in 2016, almost 2,500 youth, um, we've been gradually getting less youth, um, but then saw a steeper decline uh, when the pandemic hit. I think this also gives a good picture of the effects of um, economic conditions on access to services. Um, because what's not showing here is that Prior to 2012, we were also close to 2,500 youth, but after that economic downturn in about 2009, we dropped down to less than 2,000 youth um, because of that as well. Um, and now in 2021, uh, this pandemic has led us to actually the lowest number of youth ever in our system. Um, although our applications have started slowly picking back up, Um, so this one is sort of a zoom in on the previous slide, looking at just the one year period before the pandemic and one year period after the pandemic started. Um, and just looking at open cases per month. So you can see the change there. Um, and there is a significant difference between the slopes um, between these two periods. So that was kind of a broad look at our system. And now we'll dive deeper into data on our youth with substance, uh, substance use problems. So there are three ways we can identify youth with substance use problems in our system. Um, the first is youth with a primary diagnosis of substance use. Um, can you folks see my arrow on the screen here? Okay, <laughs> thanks, Pua. <laughs> Um, so primary diagnosis of substance use, um, it's a small percent because as Pua mentioned, typically youth should be receiving services elsewhere if substance use is their primary issue. So it, as of 2000, well within 2020, only 0.4% had a primary diagnosis of substance use. Um, second, there's youth with any diagnosis of substance use. So their substance use diagnosis could be primary, secondary, tertiary, or any one of even up to 10 diagnoses, I believe, um, that could be recorded in the system. So about one fifth of our youth have some kind of substance um, diagnosis. And then third, there's youth where substance use is a target of treatment. So a treatment provider might choose to focus on substance use regardless of diagnosis. Um, and the definition of treatment target is here. It's the strengths and needs being addressed as part of the mental health services for youth and family clients. And we collect data on what the provider is targeting at every treatment session. So here are the same three indicators, but over time. Um, so starting from the bottom, primary diagnoses of substance use have been low, um, possibly getting lower over time, which could be due to changes in our case management IT system, which happened around these years here. Um, maybe better documentation, maybe worse documentation. Um, or possibly our staff might be getting better adhering to our policy about youth with substance use as the main concern as well. Um, also, any diagnosis of substance use um, may have been increasing, um, but looking at the 2020 data point seems to be 
more steady over time. Um, we've had challenges with that diagnosis data during all those transitions in our IT system, um, which is why they weren't reported for several years there. Um, and then lastly, youth with treatment targets of substance use, um, which is this dotted, oh, sorry, this dotted green line. Um, and it appears to be decreasing and we're not sure why we actually just pulled this data um, for this presentation and noticed that, and we're really interested in that. So if you folks have thoughts um, about that, we can maybe discuss at the end. Um, and maybe there are statewide trends that might explain the decrease um, in targeting of substance use. Um, I looked at an, I had an old 2015 health barometer report. Um, and on that report, it looked like substance use treatment seemed to be increasing. Um, and some of the substance use problems seem to be decreasing in youth too. So maybe some of those are factors. Maybe within CAMBI, there's more youth receiving treatment outside of CAMBI. Um, but those are just all hypotheses that we, we've had. So we wanted to dig into um, the substance use as a mental health treatment target a little further. So looking at treatment targets is an important way for our system to try to improve the quality of services and promote greater use of our evidence-based um, practices. So as you see, there's a huge list of possible treatment targets, and this is just a portion of them. Um, ideally, what is chosen as a treatment target should come from the needs identified for the youth um, through assessments at the start of services um, and should also be reflected in the youth's treatment plans. Um, so if a treatment target of substance use is needed, um, a big question would be, what are the best interventions or treatment practices we should be using for this target? because there's a very large array of different practices used in mental health treatment. Um, again, this is only a portion of them. Um, and often, not all therapists are trained in all of them or know which have the most evidence behind them. So this is a challenge. Um, and a lot of our efforts are on guiding therapists towards those practices that are more evidence-based. So the definition of practice elements are the discrete clinical intervention strategies applied by the therapist and or treating provider within a treatment session. And so in selecting a practice for a target of substance use, for example, we often think of this as involving four questions. Um, so first, what does the research literature say is effective in treating substance use problems? What does our local research say is effective with our youth in Hawaii? What does my clinical expertise and experience say? And what has been working and not working for this particular youth? So in CAMDI, we refer to these as the four evidence bases. Um, and the first two of these, um, are things at the more macro level that we can help provide information on for our treatment providers. Um, so we put together summaries as simple and as practical as possible to help our providers toward more evidence-based practices. Um, so here's an example, just focusing on the first two rows of numbers. The first row is an indicator of evidence based on the broader research literature. And the second row is evidence based on our local Hawaii population. So specifically, um, the first row is data from an organization called PracticeWise, uh, whose job is to continually gather and review all the mental health treatment literature. And they've come up with these percents which take all the treatment protocols that have shown success based on specific standards and reflects the percent of those successful protocols that have used each 
um, practice element within the treatment protocol. So for example, 47% of successful treatment protocols use that practice element of problem solving. So higher percents indicate greater percentage um, of, indicate greater association of that practice element with successful treatment protocols. Um, and then the second row is based on a local study by Dr. Puahi um, within our Camby population. And these betas basically represent um, a greater association of that practice element with youth improvement. So basically the higher the beta is the better. Um, so this table is based on the data specifically for the target of substance use. Um, and we've sorted the data so that the practice elements with both greater general and greater local evidence for effectiveness are at the top followed by higher evidence for one or the other, and followed by limited evidence for both at the bottom. So for substance use, CAMDI encourages greater use of these practices more toward the top, um, such as problem solving, communication skills, motivational interviewing, assertiveness training, cognitive modeling, self-monitoring, functional analysis. We also provide data back to our providers on how much they are using each of these practice elements. And the goal is to move towards higher percentages at the top and smaller percentages at the bottom. So, we want to see more kids. So these are the percent of kids receiving each of those practices. We want to see more kids using the more evidence-based practices. Um, so you know, we, we do a lot of meetings with our providers and share the data back to them and provide them reports of these things too. Um, hopefully I was somewhat clear in explaining that. For any questions, feel free to put them in the, the chat or Q&A. I can try to answer them while Pua um, takes over and talks about other research studies that have been done in our population. Thanks, David. Um, so to end our talk today, I do want to share um, some other research that's been done specifically on substance use. So under David's leadership and with uh, different colleagues, such as those at the University of Hawaii, um, CAMD has really been able to um, uh, do a number of, of pretty robust research and evaluation um, uh, studies with our youth and families. Um, so a few in particular specific to substance use um, include taking a look at uh, months when substance use was targeted in treatment. Um, and what was found there was that disruptive behavior targets were the most commonly endorsed alongside that substance use treatment target. That makes a lot of sense. As I was saying earlier, we do have a really high population of kiddos. Um, about a quarter of our youth have some sort of disruptive behavior type of concern. Um, and as we know, substance use can be a comorbid concern either with an internalizing or externalizing um, type of disorder. So it does make some sense that um, our youth who do typically tend to be more externalizing or having some sort of disruptive behavior problems have both of those concerns targeted sim simultaneously in treatment. Um, another study completed by Love and colleagues took a look at substance use treatment. Uh, sorry, David, I'm still on the one before. Um, uh, took a look at substance use treatment for kiddos in intensive in-home services. And what they found is that substance use was commonly endorsed and targeted for about almost a quarter of kiddos receiving our intensive in-home or our lowest level of care. Um, uh, and I think as you saw earlier, um, perhaps that doesn't necessarily always match up necessarily with what we're seeing diagnostically, but this is definitely still a concern we wanna be paying attention to um, given just um, the high risk nature of substance use in adolescents. Um, additionally, the study found that the substance use treatment target reached an average highest progress rating um, that fell somewhere between some improvement and moderate improvement 
uh, on a rating scale that looks at, um, uh, that has anchors of, I think, zero to six, um, ranging from deterioration to complete improvement. That progress rating scale really takes a look at, uh, uh, depending on the frequency of ratings, um, always looks back to baseline. So progress rating is being defined as the degree of progress achieved between client's baseline and the time of uh, the rating. Um, so again, uh, looking at substance use, um, average highest progress rating reached between some and moderate improvement. Um, additionally, it did take about an average of 100 days in treatment to, uh, to reach that highest progress rating. Um, so an additional study by Millette and colleagues uh, took a look at youth eloping, so are running away. This is a panda bear that has nothing to do with, um, with CAMD services other than he looks to be running, running away, maybe from his residential treatment program. Um, so for uh, kiddos in, um, for kiddos in residential treatment programs, uh, we took a look at three biggest motivational categories for elopement. And what we typically find is kids are either running away from something or running to something. So the first biggest category that was identified was peer influence as a motivational uh, factor for that elopement behavior. Uh, the second was uh, uh, running from something. So running from negative stimuli within the facility and then the third was running to something, so running towards some sort of reinforcing stimuli outside the facility. And when we took a closer look at that category, what was found that a common subcategory was being a desire to use substances. So ultimately take home here is that uh, substance use was identified as, um, as a motivating factor for youth elopement from care. Um, and then, the last study that I'm going to be talking uh, with you about today uh, took a look at um, uh, really at more of a specialized population of our youth. So trying to compare those um, considered to be uh, geographically isolated versus those who are not isolated. So we wanted to really get a capture of what our services looked for substance using youth who were living in more rural areas of our state. We defined um, geographic isolation as physical separation from by water from the more populous um, and urban center of our state, Oahu. I think, as we all know, many of the more specialized treatment um, options across physical and mental health care needs, but also including for substance use concerns, tend to be located on the island of Oahu. Um, and what this study did was took a look at um, how the use of both family interventions and family members' actual involvement in services predicted substance use treatment progress for both those geographically isolated kiddos compared with non-isolated kiddos in our intensive in-home level of care. Um, we had a couple of hypotheses for this study, the first being that um, geographically isolated kids would ultimately be doing poor, um, so having uh, having poor substance use um, progress ratings, for example. And we also thought that just given stressors exist, you know, that are common to more isolated families, uh, that they may have more difficulty engaging in treatment service services. What we actually found, though, is a couple of findings that were contrary to expectation. So one being that there was actually no evidence that average substance use progress ratings were lower in geographically isolated areas compared with non-isolated areas. And we also found that there was no difference in the use of family interventions um, for geographically isolated youth compared with their non-isolated peers. Um, further, uh, what we also found was that families of isolated youth were actually involved in treatment services more frequently than non-isolated families. Um, and then taking a look at more both um, the interventions used, so um, based on those practice elements David was sharing earlier, but also individuals, so the youth's own involvement in treatment, both of these were significant predictors of average substance use progress ratings when they were considered alongside both family interventions and involvement within a multi-level model. Um, taking this a step further, um, 
we parceled out some of these findings. So taking away the individual pieces, what we found is that both family inter sorry, was that family interventions, but actually not involvement, was a significant predictor of average substance use progress ratings when they were considered independent of those individual interventions and involvement within that multi-level model. And some of the take-homes here, I think, are just really, um, uh, you know, CAMD's model of services is somewhat novel, um, particularly when we consider more isolated or more rural youth. The fact that we're able to provide in-home treatment services, I think, and do so statewide, uh, I think actually reduces a lot of the barriers that families who tend, who are more isolated and may experience more challenges getting to care might otherwise experience. Um, the other thing is that when we take a look at the evidence base for adolescent substance use treatment services, um, what we really see is that there are models of treatment that are more family-based. So uh, things like multi-systemic therapy, functional family therapy, brief, brief strategic family therapy, um, that do really have a robust um, uh, you know, effectiveness for treating those concerns. But there are also strategies that might be more individually focused. So things like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, maybe even with some motivational interviewing that have also been found to be effective. And so what our local findings here really suggest is that there may be times in treatment where more of a family approach versus an individual approach or vice versa might be um, better for a particular youth, depending on the circumstances of their unique case. Um, so thank you so much uh, today, everybody. Please let us know if you have comments or questions. We look forward to hearing from you. And David actually has just one more slide um, to share. So earlier I dropped in the chat, the chat a link to our CAMD services. Um, we also have uh, on our website um, available both um, a list of our publications uh, and other kind of information about um, uh, kind of technical reports and annual surveys that we've been we've completed. We also have some clinical tools available like the practice element matrix that David shared here today. And please let us know if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bonani and David, for this amazing presentation. Huge round of applause. Uh, so feel free to send any questions you have in the Q&A button if you see it below or also in chat. And uh, I think there are already a few that I'll go over. So first, uh, John Valera was asking about the slides. And so just wanted to say that the slides for both of our presentations today, as well as the video recording, will be posted on our SAW website. And so don't worry about that. And then I think Lisa Blair has a question, uh, which she sent in the Q&A, which is, how does CAMD work with schools in the state? And so Punani already answered in chat, but I wanted to say it out loud, which is that CAMD receives uh, educationally supported IDA referrals from the DOE, and further the CAMD treatment team typically closely collaborates with uh, youth school-based behavioral health pro providers, depending on the needs of the youth. And so Punani sent in the chat uh, information on the CAMD research, and she has a link in the chat. And so we'll just be waiting a few minutes for any questions. And in the meantime, uh, I think I ask this question every time now, but you know, during COVID, during the pandemic, is there anything you've noticed or just you know, any, I guess, things you wanted to say about that related to your work? Um, yeah, and we can actually, there's an infographic we can probably try to share too that gives a little bit um, of uh, some background here too. So just, um, I think there were several reasons. Um, part of this gets to when kids aren't in services or involved in activities um, and they're not a lot of eyes on, on kids. Uh, I think we've really seen a decline in our referrals, particularly in um, more at the start of the pandemic. Um, so just to explain that a little bit further, kiddos weren't in school. They weren't in person. They weren't um, attending their probation appointments, for example, um, and uh, and so I think that really reduced referrals across some of our typical referral streams, which do tend to be folks like the schools, um, the probations, uh, also child welfare services. Uh, this is 
a very anecdotal statement I'm about to make, but actually I think at one time, one of our highest referrals was child welfare because they were one of the only child serving agencies that was really consistently still going out uh, and seeing kiddos. Um, David, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that pandemic question. Oh, David, you're- yeah, I was on mute. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if this was the one you're referring to, Pua, but this was our applications over time. Um, usually in the summer months, we do see a drop off, obviously, um, because kids are out of school. Um, but then from the start of pandemic, from March, you can see we saw a huge drop off. I think this was a 54% drop just from March to April. Um, and then we have started coming back over time, but still not at the levels that we were before. We haven't looked at discharges, so I'm not sure if usually our, our new um, applications and discharge are sort of equal. So the number of kids in the system remains somewhat steady, but um, since we are getting more applications, I'm not sure what the discharges look like to if it's, um, you know, if, if, if it's keeping up with the applications. So. Um, so, and, and just in case folks are uh, interested in this information more broadly, so this is a this is not a direct answer to the question that was asked, but um, so I think what we found in CAMZ is that we had so between April 2020 or sorry, in co comparing April of 2020, so maybe months after start of pandemic to the prior year, April 2019, we had about a 66 percent um, uh, fewer applications that we had than we would typically see. Um, and I think other child serving systems reported similar decreases. Uh, so that I just dropped the chat to so what I'm referencing right um, in the chat box, the link in the chat. But um, I think DHS reported a 33% decrease in child welfare intake um, between you know about that March and April 2020 actually even. Um, and other systems though, I think did see an uptick. So like the crisis text line was reporting an increase in um, the number of texters that they had and whatnot. So um, lots of lots of things for sure. And as for the question in the Q and A about um, adapting for online delivery, I think we were really fortunate um, before the pandemic. Um, we got onto a new system, a new IT system, and we also started making use of Zoom a lot more. So we were ready um, when the pandemic started um, to, to go to Zoom, and we were all already getting used to that. So, um, so yeah, I think a lot of, Pua can probably speak better to how treatment is going, but I know we, we've transitioned pretty well considering yeah, so some of the things that we did, um, and previously we wrote, we really were uh, both for CAMD staff and our contracted providers, a primarily in-person service modality kind of format. Um, however, what we did was uh, uh, division-wide, we got a whole bunch of Zoom accounts. Uh, so we were ab actually able to move our operations to a telework kind of environment. I know pretty much everybody's done this at this point also. Um, the other thing we did though, was we actually supported our providers in moving to that telehealth format. And then we're able to work to, and as many other healthcare uh, agencies did, uh, really ensure that we were able to pro, uh, reimburse providers, both for the use of telehealth services, and actually in the beginning, also the um, even just phone sessions, which are not preferred, but for low resource families that might not have, be able to have access to things like Zoom or FaceTime, uh, to be able to um, be able to see the provider in that type of format. Um, just anecdotally, I think we'll have to really delve into this moving forward. It does seem that we've actually been able to expand our reach um, in some way. So what's been kind of, a, I guess, I don't know if I would call anything related to the pandemic a gain, but like a secondary gain has almost been the opportunity to be able to uh, serve therapists, um, serve kiddos from therapists across island. So if one particular service has a really high wait list, but we have a contract with that service on another island who maybe ha doesn't have a wait list, 
we can go ahead and use a therapist from a different island to serve that kiddo. Um, and, uh, and I think what we're really finding is that while telehealth is not the right fit for everybody, it's definitely been a good fit for some families um, and is likely something we wanna be maintaining moving forward in perhaps more of a hybrid format. So there's a question about functional impairments. Um, so we use a measure called the Child and Adolescent Functional Assessment Scale that looks at impairment across, I think, eight major domains, um, uh, school or work if it's older youth, the home environment, the community uh, environment, so things like rule breaking, kind of law, um, by legal violations, types of behavior, uh, substance use, moods and emotions, self-harm, uh, thinking, and I may be missing one. Um, uh, there's also a version of this uh, measure called the PECFIS, which is a, uh, a version for preschoolers um, for, for younger youth. Uh, so we use um, typically about a rating of 80 on that score to determine what is considered to uh, to really be kind of in need of our services. Um, there are sometimes exceptions to that, particularly if the kiddo has a major area of concern that might not traditionally be captured um, as well by that, uh, by that um, particular measure. But so generally significant functional impairment across those, those types of domains. Um, so, oh, David, you want to answer this, or you can type as I verbally answer. Um, so, we serve a primarily Medicaid population. Um, we are actually uh, not able to uh, provide services for private insurers. However, um, as I was saying earlier, and I think somebody else asked it, um, Lisa Blair asked the question earlier about working with the schools. Um, we do, um, we are able to serve a youth if indicated and, um, and needed based on uh, uh, their educational needs also. Um, and so sometimes youth who don't meet our criteria in terms of not being uh, a MedQuest youth uh, may have access to other uh, funding streams such as that. Uh, on occasion, we do have specialized programs that offer other potential um, uh, a funding stream as well. Yeah, and just to add to that answer in the Q and A, um, so we haven't reported um, in any of our public reports about insurance um, use. We in our older reports we have reported that, but. Lately, um, we've changed kind of the data collection and have had some trouble getting people to make sure they report that on a consistent basis. <laughs> um, so we haven't reported that in more recent years, but we do look at it internally and pull that data whenever we need to. Hope that helps. All right, I'll give it a minute for any more questions. Um, I'll also drop my email and David's email into the chat. If you have a question later, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. I guess a question I have for folks, um, since we have a lot of experts here on substance use treatment, um, are we still seeing increased um, treatment use in our communities um, and as well as decreased use 
from by use. Also, is maybe is there any recommendations on um, reports that might have that information that we could look into? <laughs> If you do have any answers to David's or thoughts on David's questions, I'm sure he would love to hear from you. Please email him. Um, thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate all of your questions today um, and the sort of webinar discussion we had. Um, if you have any other questions for us or want to know more about Canby services generally, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Once again, thank you so much, Ponani and David, for the wonderful presentation and for answering everyone's questions. And so with that, uh, we're going to be having a short 10 minute break. And so we'll see you at 2 p.m. All right, uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you had a good break. Uh, so now we're ready to begin the second half of our quarterly meeting. So please join me in welcoming Kyle Ishizaka and Jeanette DeMello from the Kalihi YMCA. Virtual round of applause. Aloha, good afternoon. Thank you so much for um, allowing us to have this time to present with you guys. I'm Jeanette DeMello, I'm the clinical director with the Kalihi, uh, YMCA of Honolulu Kalihi Branches Adolescent School-Based Treatment Program. I also have on the, with me Kyle Ishizaka, who is our Executive Director of the Kalihi YMCA. Um, and he will also be on this call to be able to answer any questions that may come up or provide any type of feedback. Um, Bobby, for this, do I share my screen or how are, we gonna, are you gonna, screen. I share my screen? Yeah, if you have your presentation ready. All right, yes. Hold on one second. I'm kind of technolo technologically challenged, so I have someone helping me. <laughs> okay. Okay, can everyone see that? We can see it. Okay. No, I can see it. Okay, so as I said, okay, so as I said, I'm clinical director of the Adolescent School Based Treatment Program. Um, we are, uh, we started providing adolescent substance abuse treatment since the 1980s. Uh, we are funded by the Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, or ADAD. Um, and in about 2006 or 2007, um, legislation decided that they wanted to start providing treatment services also in the middle schools. When we started in the 80s, it was more high schools. And that, be, that became um, apparent 2006, 2007, as they started to see the trends of adolescent substance use starting to be 
um, at a younger age that they felt, you know, as a preventative factor to have treatment in the middle schools as well as in the high schools would give an overall uh, opportunity for youth to learn the skills, to stay away from alcohol and drugs, to get the assistance they needed. Um, right now, we have recently been refunded and our current contract is running from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2023. Um, we can get referrals from youth from very or various ways. First, as the school administration, we work with all of the school faculty, the teachers, the principals, even security, in order to um, get referrals from youth that may be experiencing um, substance use, substance experimentation, or just having some at-risk behaviors in the school. Um, we can also have youth that we have in program that may be referring um, their friends or people that they know that might be able to get some assistance through treatment. Um, they can come in on their own. Um, once in a while, we will have parents that contact us and share with us that they you know have some concern for their kids, especially for the youth that may be getting caught on campus uh, using or um, possessing paraphernalia or alcohol or drugs. And also we can also have outside providers um, contact us from other agencies as well as probation officers that will sometimes make referrals to us. Um, currently with this new contract, uh, our out, we can provide outpatient as well as intensive outpatient treatment. We do have a thorough screening and assessment process to look at what type of appropriate level of care the youth needs. And from there, um, you will utilize Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division's care system um, to get the youth set up in that appropriate level of care. Right now, the program is 12 weeks long, but we do have the opportunity for kids who are um, at a higher need or has showed justification that 12 weeks isn't enough. We can do benefit exceptions through um, ADAD in order to extend those services, um, as well as a braided fund of graded programming where we can refer to other agencies to catch some of the services that we can't provide or which is with that is outside of the YMCA's expertise. Um, we do provide individual and group counseling sessions to the youth. Um, we utilize various curriculums, um, including our own in-house curriculum that's developed as well as evidence-based curriculum, such as the seven challenges program, which provides the youth an opportunity to sit through individual and group sessions it has journals and it has other things that we can work with with the youth in order to get them to identify issues and things that are going on in their life. Our program is year round. Um, so even though when school is, even though we're a school-based program, when school is out, we're still providing services. So we do meet with the youth uh, during summer, intercession, school breaks, after school hours, um, both in the community as well as in the school. And the last thing of all is our program is voluntary. So although the school sometimes will give us referrals, um, it still is up to the youth to participate. Currently, we are at 26 middle schools and high schools around the island, as you can see, I've listed. Um, in addition, we provide adolescent services to the island of Lanai, and this year, um, and Octo as of October 1st, also to the island of Moloka'i. Uh, before COVID, uh, we were flying out to Lanai a weekly, we had a team of counselors that would come out to provide services to the youth um, that were in need of treatment and also for us to um, provide the group sessions during and, and this also was year round. Um, with COVID, we had to, we have not been on the island, but we have continued to provide services via telehealth. So the philosophy of the YMCA is that we're going to meet youth where they're at. Um, that includes where we, because of the referral processes, we get youth that could be in different stage, in the different various stages of change. So we can get youth that feel that they have no issue with drugs and alcohol. It could really be in pre-contemplation, think that everything is going well, as well as we can get kids all the way to the other side who have realized the issues that has caused them and they're already in that preparation or action stage and trying to make those changes. The philosophy of the why is that we're gonna meet them where they're at and depending if they're in pre-contemplation or they're in action, we're just gonna to try to work with them and see if we can give them the tools and those resources that that need. And even if they get out of treatment now, it may not be um, in that place where they're al alcohol and drug free, they have some of those coping, the skills and resources for when they are ready. Um, we do meet them at school. 
Uh, we also meet them at home or in their community, wherever it is that they feel the most comfortable and safe so that they can talk about those issues that are going on in their life. Um, we also have our staff that do outreaching. So we're gonna outreach in the schools. We're gonna walk around during recess and lunch to let the kids know that we are on campus. We are a resource for them. But in addition, our staff also go out into the community. So we're gonna be going to the, the beaches, the parks, the shopping centers, the malls, wherever the youth hang out and just kind of say like, hey, we are here, we are a resource. And um, if, you know, if, even if they don't feel they're appropriate for the why, maybe there's some other programs that we can refer them to or point them in the right direction for other issues that they might wanna deal with. Um, another one of our philosophies is that we feel that during school hours, youth, for the most part, are safe. They have structure. They're in an environment that will keep them safe. It's really after school and during the breaks that youth are most likely to participate in those high-risk behaviors, such as drug use, um, gang, um, being in a gang, um, unprotected sex, uh, theft, all those things. Um, so because of that, we really want to make sure that we provide a lot of our services outside of the school. So the counselors will use the school as a way to know that the, uh, a place where they know that we're there, we're part of the school, we can assist. But we do a lot of our stuff outside of the school and going out into the weekends, the evenings and the breaks um, to continue to keep them that high risk behaviors um, reduced. Uh, another philosophy is that we really believe in groups, sessions being provided to the youth. It's important for the youth to be able to build and identify a positive support network for themselves um, for them moving forward. So we wanna be able for them to see that, you know, there are other youth that they can connect with that are going through the same issues with them that are also trying to get off of alcohol and drugs that may be wanting to make changes in their life. So by providing those group services, they can meet people around their age and that they can connect to. It can also assist them in being able to learn social skills, decision-making skills, coping skills that they can take on with them moving forward. Um, so skill building and social skill building activities provided for youth are really important for us. It gives them an opportunity for them to step out of their comfort zone and for them really to challenge themselves. Pre-COVID, um, during the breaks in the intercessions, counselors would plan activities through our catchment areas because we're island-wide to provide the youth an opportunity to meet with youth that are outside of their area. And they would, you know, go to, we would go on safe hikes or maybe, uh, to the park to do some type of activities, bowling, uh, mini golf, different things like that, just to give them an opportunity of how to do some of these activities without having to be under their influence, how they can socialize and make friends and do that without having to utilize AOD. So um, another thing, wait, let me go back to my last slide. Another thing that we really wanna focus on is we realize that you know we only have the youth for so much uh, time period that they can actually be in program, but it's important that we're setting them up for their future to make sure that they have that support system. So another philosophy for the why is that we really try to look at the holistic approach of the youth and try to expose them to other agencies, other services, as well as other YMCA programs that they can get involved with as, as they are coming out of treatment. This could include our after school teen programs that we have, um, a lot of the youth we do um, while they're in treatment, they're able to uh, utilize our fitness centers uh, at our different YMCA so that they can look at how, um, you know, going to the gym, working out is another way to stay healthy um, and to be, uh, you know, get those same feelings without having to utilize AOD. And just looking at different ways that they, we can continue to connect them so that that sobriety can continue as they, as they transition out of treatment and work on becoming the best versions of themselves. Um, some of the adole uh, adolescent substance abuse trends that we've been seeing is, first of all, which I'm sure everyone is aware of, there's a huge dramatic increase over the last few years of vaping amongst adolescents. Um, you know, when vaping started to become more popular it was really middle school and high school, but we're even seeing it as young as the elementary school students that are starting to partake in this, which is very scary. Um, and I, I don't have actual any data right now, but it is something that I think we, all, all of us together need to continue to work in addressing. Um, alcohol and marijuana continue to be the most commonly abused drugs uh, by the adolescents that we some coming into our program. But we're also beginning to see a little bit more increase of experimentation and use in crystal meth, cocaine, and unfortunately, a little bit of heroin use. Um, prescription drugs continue to be a big 
um, factor in adolescent use, um, Vicodin or hydrocodone, oxycodones. Um, Xanax has, we've seen a, a bigger um, presence of Xanax amongst the youth that we work with, as well as promethazine or the cough syrup with codeine. You know, they are very interested in that, making that lean based off of some of the rappers and music influences that they have. And additionally, we have the over-the-counter medications such as cortisidine, which the youth refer to as triple C's, or NyQuil. If they cannot get that promethazine or the cough syrup with codeine, then they use NyQuil as a substitute in order to make that. Um, so as everybody knows, in March of 2020, when COVID-19 came and graced all of us, um, what we've seen since then is that we have gone through two statewide shutdowns. Um, over the last, you know, requiring the youth to redo online learning. There was a lack of social interaction. Kids weren't able to play sports. They weren't able to hang out with their friends. We saw an increased social media, internet use as a way for them to communicate. Also increased use of time of bullying and just trying to um, being, you know, cyberbullying. The increased stress from family issues, as well as the lack of resources that were available to them because they were isolated at home increase of anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues, as well as an increased substance use as a way to cope and deal. We saw a very a high increase of alcohol use. Uh, and um, we saw a decrease actually a little bit in the marijuana use because they weren't allowed to leave, but we saw the increase in the alcohol use because they would be utilizing whatever was at home or what their parents had in their cabinets. Um, because of that, um, you know, we have, we were very fortunate enough to be able to have the resources of telehealth to be able to work with the youth. Um, of course, with them being online for social learning and being on the computer all day, the last thing they wanted to do was talk on the phone or continue to have services through telehealth. So we were able to provide services. Of course, now that we can see kids face to face, we're seeing even more kids coming out. You know, they are want, they are receptive. They do want to talk. They do want to come out. They do want to socialize. Um, but during COVID, when we couldn't, we were able to um, provide uh, telehealth services. And we were also able to, as the social learning was being done, we were able to coordinate with the schools that we service in order to set up Google Classrooms that the school would set up for us. And we were doing, um, counselors were doing weekly groups, which would be like an hour social group that we, we could talk about alcohol and drug education. We did some social skill building. We did some games just as a way for them to be able to connect even though it was on Zoom. It was very um, successful. The kids enjoyed it. It was a way for them to come and talk and just be able to share their thoughts. Cause while they were in school, a lot of times it was really about the teachers teaching and them listening, but this gave them an opportunity to share, talk and communicate with each other. Um, we also, as they <clears throat> lifted the shutdown, we were able to outreach in the community. So our staff started to go back out into those malls, the beaches, the parks, the shopping centers, talking to the youth, telling them that we were still a resource um, and giving them opportunities to see if they could benefit from any of our services or if we could link them up with anybody else, depending on what they would share with us. And as we continued through that shutdown, um, as we the shutdown was lifted and we continued to provide services, we also started to meet youth in the community for in-person sessions. So we might utilize that where we meet them at the park or the beach or even at their home to provide that session. During the summertime, um, as we were um, coming out of this COVID um, restrictions, we started to do mini groups um, based on the counselor's catchment areas. So uh, for example, like Papale, so we would meet have counselors meet at Kamakana Ali'i and we would have kids show there and we would do a small group and be able to have them interact with each other and just share what's going and how they've been dealing with all of this. Um, and as the youth, um, towards the end of the school year of last year, as they started to look at identifying youth that were um, high risk and weren't doing so good uh, in school and they started to bring them back on campus, we worked with the schools in order to be on campus as well to try to connect with those youth and just try to see how we could continue to be a resource for them and how we could assist them. Um, and based on that, so from March 2020 to July 31st, we were able to provide services to 560 youth. Not all of those youth came into treatment, but we were able to touch bases with 560 youth and be able to provide some sort of service or connect them 
to something within either the YMCA or an outside provider. And Kyle, do you have anything that you want to add? Yeah, um, uh, I think Jeanette, you did a great job in describing our programming and what we do. Um, I just wanted to really emphasize that, you know, but though Kali YMCA I really feel that the relationship between the um, counselor as well as the youth that we work with is really important. Um, you know, so really focus in on the motivational enhancement piece um, early on in treatment to build that relationship with the youth. Um, the second thing, you know, with the uh, COVID pandemic, really our ability to meet the kids face to face made it a little bit more difficult to build that relationship. But we were fortunate that we did have the opportunity to get paid for and were able to bill for services uh, through telehealth as well as um, Zoom and the phone. Um, but staying with the um, COVID-19, you know, now that schools are opening back up, things are starting to open back up. I think we're going to start to see right now the impact that it had on the youth, as well as their mental health state, as well as their substance abuse use, um, you know, how they're doing with that. And, you know, we hear in the news just on Halloween, where um, there are a bunch of teens that allegedly were going out and you know, in Waikiki stealing, you know, so, you know, what kind of impact is the kids staying at home, not having the opportunity to get out, as well as, um, you know, um, be involved with the substances have an effect on things that's going on in the community, you know, hope, um, as we move forward, you know, I think we'll start to see the impact a little bit more. But I think for us, we're happy that we can get back out in the community and really serve the youth by meeting them face to face. Because I think that's an important piece for our programming. You know, I just want to say one more thing. You know, with our outer, outer islands, Lanai, what we did for the past two years, as well as with Molokai, you know, Jeanette touched about us going to the island and um, providing services there. But, you know, we had opportunity to bring a group of kids as well as one of the counselors from Lanai High School to Camp Erdman, and they participated in our ropes course there. You know, so that's something that working with the Y, we're fortunate to, to have those type of resources that we can bring the kids, you know, from the outer island, participate in a ropes course where they can really um, get to see something that's a little bit more than what they're accustomed growing up in as well as, you know, participate in something where if we're asking them to take the drugs out, you know, they got to fill it in with something else. So I experienced at Camp Ehrman to learn skills, you know, on how to work together, you know, and the team on that ropes course, I think is, um, you know, something that we're fortunate to have. So, you know, I just want to finish off um, with what Jeanette did as far as our programming, you know, with just a couple of examples of how the why has the ability, you know, to meet the kids face to face, build relationship, and hopefully um, empower them or assist them to see that there are other things besides drug use that they can possibly get involved with. Yeah, and um, I guess does anybody have any questions at this time? You know, you can type it in the Q and A or the chat. If there's no questions, then I guess we'll turn it back over to Bobby or Danette, if you had anything else. No, okay. Oh, I think we have one. Okay, we have one question from John. For Molokai and Lanai, are there other Camp Erdman activities or similar? Um, you know, for us, um, we are in the process of now starting to connect back with Lanai as well as Molokai. So we um, are hoping that we can start to go there again. But because of the pandemic, we didn't want to be the ones that transmit and bring COVID to the island. And I think the um, administration from the school as well as 
uh, Department of Health at Lanai felt the same way. So we are starting to open things up and we do look um, at bringing youth back to um, Oahu, you know, in some capacity to do what we've done in the past at Camp Urban. And, you know, it's not only the kids from Lanai or Molokai that we brought to Camp Urban. Every year, um, at least twice a year, pre-pandemic, we're bringing kids to uh, Camp Merman to participate in that um, ropes course there to challenge themselves in different ways. Any other questions for... Okay, uh, from Wayne. I'm not sure if I'm missing your last name. I apologize if it's incorrect. Wente. Uh, what were some of the online tools, platforms you used for telehealth and outreach with the youth? It's an excellent question. Jeanette, um, you feel um, like you can answer this question? Yeah. Um, so we utilized part of our curriculum to, um, to continue the sessions through telehealth. Um, what we did is we tried to, because one of the biggest things that uh, was, one of the biggest barriers was that some of the kids did not have their own cell phones. They didn't have access to doing things on their own. So what we would do is we would try to tweak our curriculum so that it wouldn't necessarily look like it was all about substance use or treatment, but more of an education basis so that we were able to still have conversations, but youth could still maintain that confidentiality of what they wanted to and not to and not share. Um, we also utilized a lot of, um, a couple of our staff were able to find uh, different um, websites through like SAMHSA and stuff that had some interactive games as well as activities that we could utilize um, that we did incorporate into our online sessions um, as well as just making um, simple stuff as like a, we did a categories game, we did Jeopardy, creating things just to get them to open up to make conversations as well as so that they're they're actually learning at the same time. You know, adolescents, if they, they, they don't realize they're learning, that's even better because they just think they're having fun and they're competitive and they wanna win, but they're also hopefully getting some information out of it. And so those are some of the things that we utilize. And I wanna echo what Jeanette is saying. I think our counselors have been really creative and had to be creative in how are they gonna outreach and um, you know work with the youth through telehealth, because in face-to-face, -face, you can be a little bit, you know, um, more dramatic and, you know, you can be more hands-on, but really with the telehealth, you know, um, it's, it's a little more difficult. So those games like what Jeanette talked about and when she shared those things with me, I thought, wow, what, the, what creativity from our counselors to be able to do those things and take the initiative, you know, to, to do those type of Jeopardy or category games you know, to present it more of a drug, drug education and, you know, help the kids to, to work through and keep them engaged during this time. I think there is a question from David Jackson. Were you folks noticing increases in substance use just as things are opening up more or did it start earlier? I think when we were going through the shutdown, um, there was, a, like I said, a reduction in marijuana use because they weren't really out, coming out of the house. They didn't really have access to go and get it, but there was an increase in alcohol use. But after the restrictions were lifted from the state shutdown and it was just about them having to be home, yes, we did see an increase of both marijuana as well as alcohol use, even the prescription drugs and the over-the-counter drugs. So I think the, the increase was through COVID, through the pandemic and even now into to now. And what I've been noticing as, um, as we we're starting this school year and all the youth are back into um, in-person learning, as I've been going to the schools and talking to the administration, they are seeing a lot more kids already getting busted on campus. They're bringing it to school. They're drinking on campus. They're trying to, um, they're, of course, the vaping is a huge issue, as well as just uh, the behaviors. You know, they don't, they didn't have that social interaction. There's an increase of fighting. There's an increase of 
Um, I just was at a school yesterday where you uh, come, uh, VP shared with me that kids were like, they feel like they're done learning for that day and they just get up and walk out of the class. They're like, we're done and they leave, you know, because they're used to last year where they could like, they're finished with learning, they close their, their computer, they turn off their camera, you know, they just walk away from it. And so they're starting to display that in the school. And so it's been an issue where kids are just walking out of class because they, they feel that they've had all they could do for the day. So there's a lot of new challenges that are coming up as we come out of COVID and a, a lot of social issues as well as substance abuse, as well as mental health stuff that are gonna be coming up. And I think we're only beginning to see what's gonna, what it's gonna look like moving forward. Uh, I think there's a, well, there is a question from Lane Nakano, and this is to everyone. During the pandemic, was there a change in the percentage of individuals referred by others that accepted, rejected participation in the program? Well, what was the question again? I'm sorry. During the pandemic, was there a change in the percentage of individuals referred by others that accepted rejected participation in the program? So I guess if a school administrator referred someone to our program, was there a change in maybe the youth being more receptive to programming pre-pandemic versus, and maybe now not you know, as uh, receptive? So any type of change in their acceptance rece um, rejection? I don't think there was much of a change. Um, I think the biggest issue was that there wasn't, we didn't really have any referrals coming from the school um, because they were disconnected. The kids were on learning from home. So they really didn't feel that they knew if there was any of these kids that were dealing with these behaviors. So a lot of the um, youth that we were working with were either kids that we were worked with previously that we were doing our follow-up on because we do a three month and six month follow up after they complete program. So through those conversations, we were meeting, you know, talking to youth who were sharing that, you know, they were um, struggling or they had friends that they were worried about, as well as from our staff going out and actually outreaching and being out in the community was how we were getting it. But I do know that now that we're coming out of COVID, the referrals are coming in a lot from the school because now that the kids are back in cam on campus, they're able to see the behaviors, they're able to actually interact with the youth, they're seeing that there are some stuff that's going on. And so the referrals have definitely increased. And the youth are pretty receptive because it is in person. Hope that answers the question. And Lane says, yes, thank you. <laughs> While we're waiting for uh, any more questions, sorry if this is a little bit broad, but I was just thinking, uh, how do you guys uh, see things looking in the future? <laughs> Jeanette, you wanna take a stab at that? <laughs> I, 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 think program, <laughs> I think programmatically, I mean, um, like again, because of the not knowing what the impact is really, and we're going to start to see how things start to unfold as we get more into um, kids coming back, as we start to open up more. I mean, we're really going to see what the behaviors of the youth are coming back, right? Um, I think there's going to be a lot more opportunities for mental health because, again, throughout the pandemic, not just for teens, but I think for everyone, families, you know, parents, seniors, um, the social isolation, the anxiety that was placed through the, um, you know, the virus, um, um, you know, the uh, employment issues, all of these things, you know, um, I think people need more, you know, are going to need different um, types of resources um, to help them. So as a provider, I mean, you know, there's opportunities possibly. Um, so looking at that point as a provider, but, you know, I mean, as far as services, 
you know, how do we be creative in meeting the needs of the community, whether it be, um, you know, families with loss of employment or, you know, um, just helping them to reconnect, um, you know. So, you know, I, I think that's kind of where it's at as an executive director and kind of looking at where we're at. You know, in the clinical aspect, Jeanette, um, what do you see? Um, I just, I believe that, um, you know, with our being, us being funded by the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, I really think that they're working hard to really look at how the continuum of care can go from all the way from like the prevention side all the way to the treatment, and inter, you know, intervention and treatment. So I think, and they're also looking at how the different providers can come together and we can really um, like braid our services and everybody can take what their strengths are and kind of like utilize that in order to provide the best holistic care for not only youth, for adults as well, um, but we are adolescent providers. So I'm gonna talk about the adolescent side. So I think that that, and to have that and to have that conversation be at the table and to see that, you know, not every provider individually isn't gonna be able to provide all the services or be the best level of care or be the only level of care that a youth can need or adult can need, but that we can actually look at how we can all work together and provide those services. And even on the outside with the, you know, now that school's going back, um, it's very refreshing because we've had schools in the past who really didn't really feel that there was an issue on their campus and there wasn't really a need. But now we're seeing this change as we're coming out of COVID where they're like calling and being like, can you please come here? Can you do, can you do some groups? Can you do some education? Can you be on, you know, can you come back on campus? So I think that's a shift in thinking too. So in that point, I mean, I think there's more people coming to the table. I think more people are looking at what it is that we need to do. And I'm hoping and and I feel confident that we can only get better from this, right? And is, if people are prepared and people are aware to, are, are able to identify it, I think that's right. We can just hopefully all come together and um, get through this. And I just want to add um, from David Jackson, I'm glad that um, he put this in also. So. He say, states that uh, that seems to be what the research is suggesting too. So probably increase in mental health needs. So I think we're all kind of feeling the same thing at this point. I'll give it you know, a minute or so for any last questions and then I'll chime in with another you know, kind of broad question again of my own, which is, do you see um, any differences like here in Hawaii compared to the mainland? Jeanette, I, I defer this to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, differences as in substance use or? I guess so, or just, you know, anything else that you notice in general? Um, I don't know too, I mean, I think, um, so I, I was at a school yesterday talking with one of the principals and, um, they, she was saying that from what her friends that she talks to in the schools in the mainland, the issues seem to be the same with like the whole education, the increase of the drug use, the mental health needs. Um, so in that aspect, I do feel that we're kind of like on along the same lines. Um, I do feel personally that for us, I mean, I know that there's in the mainland, there's not as much options for treatment. There's not going to be a treatment program based at a middle school and a high school in the mainland. It's more you have to go through your medical insurance or it's uh, a residential or, you know, you put the youth has to be at like a higher level. So I think in that aspect, I think we're ahead of the game because I, we have so many resources for our adolescents that are right at the school level where they don't really have to go. And, you know, part of the philosophy of the why is we meet them where they're at. So we don't expect them to come to us. We're going to go to them. And so I think that's something that's different. That's good. Very good. Jan. And, you know, the other thing that, as Jenna was speaking, that comes to my mind is in the past, the trend has been that the mainland would take place and then it'll trickle down to Hawaii, you know, but right now it seems like we're all in the same place, you know, um, you know, in the past, crystal meth would become a problem and then it would start to come to Hawaii and, you know, it start to escalate here. But right now, you know, we really cannot look at what's happening on the mainland and kind of foresee what's gonna happen here. 
you know, with this pandemic, I think it's kind of put everybody at a, you know, equal place as far as what we're going through and each place is going through its own, you know, so. Any, any other questions that people may have? Uh, I guess while we're waiting just a little bit more, is there an email or some kind of way anyone can you know contact you guys if they have any more questions at some point? Yes, um, I'll type it in our chat for Jenna and myself. Awesome, thank you, Kyle. Uh, I think we're uh, done with questions, so we'll just be moving on to closing remarks. So once again, just thank you so much, Danette and Kyle, for your wonderful presentation and answering everyone's questions. We truly appreciate you being here, even though it's you know virtually through Zoom. But I think we're all used to it at this point. So hopefully, at you know some point, we can meet in person or you know do something else like that. But first, uh, we would like to ask everyone to please fill out uh, this brief survey to get your feedback on this meeting. So uh, let's see, sorry, uh, there we go. So if you see it in chat, it's just a quick uh, survey you can fill out. And then we're working on setting up the future uh, SDW quarterly meetings in 2022, along with finding speakers. So if you have any ideas for future speakers who would be willing to share you know, data or anything related to substance use, please let us know by sending us an email at piac plus uhsaw at hawaii.edu, which I'll be sending in chat right now as well. And you know, we'd be more than happy to reach out to anyone that you think would be a good fit. And so I think we mentioned it earlier on, but the slides and the video recording for today's quarterly meeting will be posted on our website. And so if you just want any more details on SUW, such as our recordings, minutes, slides from our previous meetings, along with our deliverables, you can visit our website at go.hawaii.edu slash capital G-R capital J. Sorry, it's just gonna be a bunch of links. But yeah, so that's our uh, website. And then also uh, one more thing, same as last year, we're updating our SCW membership list to uh, make sure it's up to date. And so in order for that, we want to obtain your consent to include your you know, first and last name, title, organization, SCW membership years uh, on public materials, you know, such as reports, websites, et cetera, technology involvement, and also gain uh, media consent for video recordings such as this you know, current meeting and you know, photographs, et cetera. And so I'm mentioning this form, which we should be sending out in email as well. But in case you wanted to fill it out now, here's the link. And so, yeah, so just as a reminder, I, I sent us so many things, but the first Google link is for the feedback survey for today's uh, meeting. And then there's our email address if you have any questions you want to ask us. And then the go.hawaii.edu link is for our SAW webpage. And then finally, the last Google form is for our SCW membership, you know, renewal or uh, joining form. And so with that, uh, that concludes our SCW quarterly meeting for November 2021. So please stay safe, everyone, and enjoy your weekend. And I'll be here just for, you know, one more minute in case there's any last questions or anything. But yeah, once again, you know, thank you so much, David, Ponani, uh, Jeanette, and Kyle. Really amazing meeting. One last virtual round of applause.